Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Illica PLC Investor Update. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it, where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your InvestMe company dashboard, and we will notify you by email when these are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And now I'd like to hand you over to Graham Purdy, CEO, and Steve Boydell, CFO. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon, Alessandro. Many thanks for the intro. Good afternoon. So many thanks to um, attendees of this update. Um, actually, today it's our AGM, and um, we thought it was useful to uh, give a recap of our activities over the summer because we haven't been able to host um, any attendees at the AGM due to COVID restrictions. Um, but uh, we'd like to thank you for um, voting, those of you who did, uh, to unanimously pass uh, all of our um, all of the motions. And um, well, let's uh, crack on with the presentation and give you an update. So, uh, as Alessandro said, you've got myself and Steve Boydell who are presenting this afternoon. Um, I won't linger on our bios. Uh, if you're interested, of course, you can look us up on our website. Uh, Ilica is one of the, the few independent experts in solid state batteries, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, in this presentation over the next half an hour or so. Um, there are two parts to our business. One is uh, our Stereax technology, which we're currently scaling up, and I'll give you an update on where we are with the implementation of our manufacturing strategy as we go through the presentation. There you see uh, one of our engineers holding up a wafer uh, of our Stereax cells for uh, inspection. And actually, if you look at it closely, you can see that in fact the wafer is transparent um, because it's a glass-based wafer with the, the batteries that are deposited onto it and, and then uh, etched and, and singulated out of the wafer. And then on the bottom left, um, you see pictures of our Goliath cells, um, which are uh, de designed for EVs and also for uh, consumer appliances. So the markets that we're addressing are huge. Um, on the one hand, our Stereac cells for medtech and industrial IoT uh, or industrial wireless sensors. Um, in their own right, they are multi-billion markets, but we think of them as being actually uh, niche markets or certainly smaller than the markets for Goliath. Uh, Goliath is really designed for some of the biggest battery markets on the planet. Um, actually, consumer appliances is currently the biggest market, but is rapidly being overtaken uh, by electric vehicles. And of course, by 2025, we expect the EV markets to be the dominant one, largely because, of course, uh, the batteries that you need in order to drive an EV are much larger in size uh, than the batteries that you put into consumer appliances. And therefore, uh, actually, the overall value of the market uh, is expected to become larger. So why are people interested in solid state batteries? Why do they continue to uh, uh, get excited about this market? Well, um, first of all, uh, solid state batteries are ultra compact. So my rule of thumb is that they're about half the volume of a traditional lithium ion cell. So they enable a smaller battery pack design. Um, they are tolerant of higher temperatures. So actually our Stereac cells will operate at up to 150 degrees C. And this opens up industrial markets where traditional lithium ion uh, can't really support because standard lithium ion 
is typically rated up to about 60 degrees C. And this is also really important actually uh, in the automotive sector because a lot of the volume and weight of a battery pack is taken up by the, the parasitic weight of the cooling system. So the fluid and the pumps and the heat exchangers that you need in order to keep a traditional battery pack uh, operating within its safe design window. The other advantage is that solid state cells are rapid charging. Um, again, our rule of thumb is that they're actually six times faster charging than lithium ion. So if a normal lithium ion pack needs an hour to charge, then you can expect that a solid state pack will charge in about 10 minutes. There are also environmental benefits. Now, currently only about 5% of lithium ion cells are recycled um, and they are environmentally harmful due to that uh, toxic liquid electrolyte which needs to be drained out before the more valuable uh, metals in the cells can be recovered and recycled. There's also a risk of fire and explosions, um, so they can't be landfilled or incinerated. With oxide solid state batteries, which is the type of solid state cells that ILICA specializes in, there's no such risk of explosion because the electrolyte is not flammable. Um, and actually fairly common process technologies uh, can be used. Uh, effectively, you strip off the packaging around the cells and that gives you a type of oxide ceramic, which you can then um, shred and you can put the, um, the materials through a standard precipitation process to allow you to recover the metals and put them back into the supply chain. So how do we make money from our battery business? Um, so over the last few years, we've been operating a pilot line for our Steriac cells. Um, in order to do that, we've been uh, fabricating the, uh, the cells on wafers that we buy in. We then thin and dice those wafers, uh, stack them, form the cells, and, and test them before sending them to customers. So effectively, it's a small manufacturing operation. Um, we are actually transitioning from being a, a technology developer selling small quantities of wafers uh, for company evaluation through to being uh, a manufacturer of, um, of about 70 times the volume of such cells. And that'll all happen from next year when uh, our wafer fab, our first factory, has been fully commissioned. Um, and again, we will continue to receive purchase orders from customers uh, and execute the contract manufacturing of those. Uh, licensing is the model that we will move to for larger scale production, because rather than build a string of uh, factories around the world, uh, we will be actually a, a design authority in which we'll license IP to larger scale manufacturers. Um, and then uh, the company that's taken the license to the technology uh, will uh, manage the customer interface and the supply chain. So where are we with, um, with that factory? Well, it's been a, a really uh, exciting summer for us because you know, we've seen the, uh, the clean room in which we install all of our equipment completed uh, to specification. Um, and the, the major tools have now all arrived. Um, that whole process has been coordinated by a, uh, a tech transfer director, Paul Maron, who we've brought in specifically to build a team with industrial experience and complement the scientific team that originally developed the technology. Um, he's overseen the completion of that clean room and, of course, the installation of the tools. And actually, we've got most of the, the vendor uh, support engineers on site at the minute, uh, helping us uh, commission that equipment and then move it into what we call the, the process qualification uh, part of the, um, the fab development, which is where we have all of the equipment operating um, to allow us to start to make products that we then qualify 
uh, ready for sales to uh, industrial and, and med tech customers. And we've invested now uh, about three and a half million of the, the four million total expected spend on this fab uh, implementation. So a few pictures actually of what the inside of that clean room looks like. So actually the outside looks pretty um, uh, clean and, and well presented and uncluttered. That's the picture you see at the bottom there, second from the left. The actual equipment itself, of course, is is very much um, you know integrated into uh, the fab, so that there's not a large amount to see once it's actually installed. On the left hand side, you see what we refer to as tool two, uh, which is our principal sputtering equipment. Um, the the yellow window looks into the photolithography and etch suite that we've got, and then the photograph on the far right. Uh, which actually looks a bit like a Dalek from this perspective, is uh, what we call Tool 1, which is a large evaporator. Um, you see the, the black um, control panel uh, on the far right of that image. Um, the, the bit that looks like the Dalek is actually the door that you open, and then you can put the wafers into the deposition chamber. Um, so, you know, uh, in terms of uh, getting commercial... Uh, pipeline in place for the sales of what this facility will be producing. Um, we've already sold evaluation samples to a portfolio of about 16 customers from the pilot line, and we've put uh, confidential agreements in place, uh, about 48 of them, with customers who are interested in evaluating uh, the, the sales that come off this line. So about 27 of them are with uh, industrial IoT and 21 with MedTech. So uh, one of the other things that's happened is that we've identified substantial addressable markets to overutilize the, the 3,500 wafers of peak capacity from this manufacturing facility. Uh, and actually, because there is more demand than we'll be able to supply from this facility, that really validates the opportunity for licensing and going into that third phase of the model that we were just talking about. In terms of the application areas, uh, those of you who have heard me speak before will know that um, we are, uh, you know, we've been talking about these addressable uh, market segments consistently for a couple of years now. Uh, we, we've got this insight because you know we've sent samples from our pilot line through to customers in these segments, uh, and they've told us, yeah, you know, the specification of what you can make is a match with our applications. Some of them are relatively well-defined small niches where we have a unique selling point, and in an industrial IoT, the high temperature tolerance of our cells is really important to enable. Um, some of the applications that people have in mind. So, you know, you'll all have heard actually about the tremendous stress that the semiconductor supply chain is under. People are really looking to get as much production as possible from uh, the fabs that they have in place and been able to calibrate those fabs to get a high yield and a, a high output is really key to making sure that that invested capital is made best use of. And that's what wafer sensing is all about. Effectively, you can put our battery powered sensors onto wafers that are being uh, used to calibrate the process conditions of the semiconductor manufacturing chambers uh, and therefore get a, a better yield out of the processes that people are running. There are also condition monitoring applications um, we've got a, a really good case study on our, our, our website about the wind turbine deployment. And then, of course, process equipment um, such as um, refineries and chemical plants uh, and power stations, as well as infrastructure. Uh, because often, you know, infrastructure that's out in the, in the open is exposed to very high temperatures in the direct sunlight. Uh, so having... Um, uh, devices that are by rail tracks or on bridges, you know, you, you need to be able to have a very robust power supply for those applications. With miniature medical implants, uh, we believe that orthopedics is pretty much the biggest addressable market for us. Um, there's a big 
um, uh, let's say, a tsunami of innovation that's sweeping through uh, the healthcare industry where a lot of these miniature medical implants uh, are metamorphosing from being a uh, largely mechanical, um, um, you know, straightforward uh, device that doesn't actually interact with um, the user in terms of data generation. Uh, these devices are becoming, um, you know, smart so that we're making measurements of how well they're performing and then sending that information uh, from the implants through to databases so that consultant surgeons can give advice on recuperation from surgery, uh, on physiotherapy to allow the patient to get the most out of the intervention. Also, nerve stimulation. Uh, this is all about um, using electroceuticals to replace uh, chemical uh, drugs, to, to replace painkillers, uh, sensors such as uh, blood pressure monitors, and even ophthalmic applications where you are um, coming up with devices that can assist with some of the degenerative diseases that can rob people of their sight. So some fantastic global opportunities there. So that's Steriax. Let's change gear a little bit and talk about Goliath and um, the uh, the market um, that we're interested in uh, selling Goliath batteries into. Um, I think the EV revolution is well and truly underway. Uh, annual sales are accelerating. Um, I think um, most of us are, are looking forward to our uh, first exposure to EVs. Um, and most of the forecasts are very strong in terms of EV uptake. Um, so we're very much aligned with this general market growth. And what you see on the bottom left here is a chart actually from Bloomberg NEF, where there's a forecast for uh, EV batteries in Europe and the US uh, and how those batteries uh, are likely to uh, to change from being what we know now as a traditional lithium-ion cell through to a solid-state cell. And you can see that over the next 15 years, that actually solid-state is expected to become the dominant technology. So it's going to displace traditional lithium-ion cells. So it's really exciting to be in at the front end uh, of this market uh, takeover. Um, we've seen similar analogs for this type of technology replacement in the past uh, in batteries, uh, with NiCad batteries and nickel metal hydride batteries being overtaken by lithium ion. Uh, and we expect that the solid state form of lithium ion will become dominant in EVs. So what is it that's different from our program relative to other developers uh, of solid state batteries? Well, first of all, we use a, a silicon anode, um, which uh, is different from the lithium metal anodes that some other developers are using. We believe that there's some intrinsic advantages around the cyclability of silicon and therefore the, uh, the long cycle life that you can get from using a silicon anode. We know how to manage the interface resistances that you get uh, in forming a composite solid state structure because we've had to do that in Sterex in order to define that product. We're, we're probably one of the organizations that's worked the longest in innovating solid oxide electrolytes. Uh, some of our patents go back a good 10 years now when we were screening different solid electrolytes to find the ones that have the optimum performance and functionality. Um, we understand how to make devices, so not only how to make an electrolyte, but how to get a complete cell architecture to work. And of course, we've just been through a very interesting scale up of uh, effectively a, a lab process through to a pilot line and now through to a manufacturing process. So we know all about the challenges of taking lab scale uh, results and then turning them into qualified products. Our view on uh, Goliath cells is that actually 
um, we will continue to use best-in-class cathode materials. There's an awful lot of R&D being done to develop superior cathode materials. And uh, what we want to do going forward is to make use of the best-in-class materials that are available so that our cells, from a solid-state perspective, offer the best performance to our customers. So there's a few additional milestones in terms of technical development that we've achieved uh, over the summer. Um, you know, we, you can actually track our progress really nicely uh, relative to where we were just a year ago. Uh, so we started out making Goliath cells that uh, would give us 100 cycles without failure. But actually, within about six months, we'd increased that to over 500 cycles without failure, and that's continuing to increase. Uh, we expect that you know the industry is looking for um, over a thousand cycles, and uh, our data is reassuring in that regard. We're also getting good conversion efficiency, so we had over 90 percent in in our stable cells um, back in Q4 of 2020. And, and that allowed us then to move on to demonstrating a reproducible manufacturing baseline. So uh, that's key uh, as you go through uh, the scale up of any technology is to be able to do the same thing day in and day out. Um, and also actually to optimize the, the process that you've got so that you get the best out of the materials that you've chosen to make your cells out of. So um, on the bottom right, actually, you see a diagram of the improvement relative to where we were just back in July uh, for our red baseline cells. And they're the same materials, but we've improved the process that we use for making them. So you see that general upward trend. And then what we mean by non-baseline cells is where we're starting to tweak the materials. Um, so where we look at different um, sintering aids, different formulations in order to get the best performance possible out of the cells. And that's, uh, that's usually a, a bit more of a, a scattergun um, result because you get some cells where actually that works really well, uh, like you see the, the top end of those blue points, and others actually where it doesn't quite give you the result that you want. But that's what technology development's all about. And as long as you're hitting some top end improvements, then you harvest those results uh, and use them to build the technology program going forward. Um, what we've also done actually over the summer is reduce the temperature at which the cells operate. Solid state cells always operate better at elevated temperature. They generally have a, a higher capacity and also uh, a higher power density but we've been able to come up with a cell architecture that gives us cells that now cycle at room temperature and also ones that give us an increased cathode utilization. So that basically converts into uh, the higher capacity trend that you see on the bottom right there. So in terms of our commercialization pathway for Goliath, it's very much uh, as it was. Um, we're currently in the middle of a very intensive and accelerated process development as well as technology development. We've got some trials that are ongoing at the minute looking at different routes for making our cells uh, at volume, uh, working with different equipment vendors and technology centers around the world. Um, so that's allowing us actually to do a, a scale up feasibility. Um, at our own facility um, here in the UK, we'll be going from uh, a, a pre-pilot facility of a, a kilowatt hour a week through to tenfold that uh, by the end of 2022, uh, implementing some of these new process routes that we've been assessing, uh, and then providing enough cells so that our partners, typically automotive OEMs, can build modules and packs and use their BMS technology. Uh, and then drop that into what the industry calls uh, mule tests, which are effectively prototype vehicles that uh, are put onto test tracks. Um, we've got a, a framework agreement in place with the UK BIC, um, which is the Battery Industrialization Center in the Midlands. 
so we will be transferring our technology into a facility like that to allow us to test and validate larger quantities of the cells and then actually transfer into a gigafactory scale. And there you see a series of product milestones that we expect to hit as we go through that timeline. So first of all, consumer cells, these are the consumer appliance applications, um, which are typically you know, slightly smaller cells and batteries than you get in a vehicle, um, but also the generations of auto cells as we go through and, and some of the, the specifications and design performance that we expect uh, out of those different products. So in summary, you know, where we are today is that we're manufacturing on a pre-pilot line. Um, we've developed the technology together with Honda, McLaren and JLR and, and other automotive OEMs and consumer appliance OEMs. Um, we've got a relationship in place now with Coma. We've got an ongoing program with them, Coma being part of the Fiat group uh, to, uh, to scale up to pilot line uh, scale. Uh, and to get us through uh, mid-2024 on the back of the, uh, the placing that we successfully secured in July uh, to, uh, to be ready for manufacturing um, and transfer into a facility like the BIC uh, with a view, again, ultimately to licensing that into gigafactory scale. So just a little bit of context about consumer appliance markets. Um, you know, there's some very vibrant uh, and exciting markets that are a really good fit with solid state batteries. Um, health and beauty. So these guys have a, a high uh, energy and power density requirement, fairly compact devices. Um, E-cigarettes. Um, and then power tools and cameras, similar sort of requirement to health and beauty, but uh, a very substantial market in, uh, in its own right. And then, of course, medical. So this isn't to be confused with uh, the Steriax opportunity, which is for miniature medical devices. But there are some applications which require a larger capacity, so typically things like pacemakers, where safety is uh, ultimately the most important parameter. Um, and we're able to sell, let's call them mini Goliaths into that opportunity. So Steve's got a few figures actually, just to give you an overview uh, of where we got to post our year end results. Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of items of note uh, since we last reported our financial results for the year ended uh, 30th of April, which we did back in July. Uh, the first of these was the completion of the fundraise, which I've detailed on this slide. Um, the placing raised 18 million. Um, we did an open offer, which closed very quickly and was fully subscribed, uh, 3.7 million. Um, and then a fully subscribed retail offer as well, a company called Primary Bid that raised a further three million. Um, and we did this pretty efficiently, we thought, uh, given that the fees for the, the whole raise was, was under a million pounds. So uh, net funds raised were, were 23.8, all of which were uh, secured in our account uh, last month. Um, and these funds have been earmarked with, uh, with 10 million to accelerate Goliath development through uh, through lithium ion equivalents and beyond by uh, December 2022, and uh, five million of capex to enable a tenfold increase in our Goliath pre-pilot line um, capacity in Romsey, which we aim to be complete by Q1 2023. The uh, the other more recent development was our um, uh, our shares being released on the OTCQX um, US. Retail shareholders currently make up about just over 15% of our register. And this uh, this listing effectively is, is upgraded us from the pink market, which is a, is a fairly unregulated um, over-the-counter market in the US, to the OTCQS best market. So this um, does put a little obligation on us to make sure that uh, we release regulated news and financial reports at the same time in the US as, uh, as we release them to the AIM market in the UK. But it does mean that um, US retail shareholders 
can um, buy the shares as they're denominated in, in US dollars, they can trade in, uh, in US working hours, and they can. the biggest innovation is actually they can um, access them through online share dealing platforms as opposed to having to go to a broker uh, to buy the shares for them. So that's the uh, ILICA F ticker as we're now traded on the OTCQX. Thanks, Steve. So just to wrap up, um, I believe that we're strongly positioned to progress the commercial scale-up of Stereax through this fab implementation. Um, and actually, I hope to be able to invite investors to visit that facility towards the end of the year. Uh, I think it'll be um, a really impressive visit and a, a fantastic opportunity to see the technology in action. We'll also be uh, maturing our Goliath technology with our partners um, through a series of technical milestones, which we'll keep you informed about over the next 18 months or so. Uh, and they will form a great platform for uh, revenue growth going forward. So that wraps up the slide presentation. Um, hopefully, we will now get the opportunity to have a, a Q&A session. Graham, Graham D. D. Thank you very, very much for your um, for your presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Me company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. We received a number of pre-submitted questions from investors, which I believe Graham and Steve have kindly written responses to and these will be published after the meeting. Um, but for now, investors have also submitted questions during the live event and I want to turn back to, to you to respond to to those where it is appropriate to do so. Could I ask you to read out the question and then say who it is from? Thank you very much, Alessandro. So thanks for submitting your questions, guys. We're just gonna have a bit of a trot through these and uh, see if we can provide some quick answers. So um, first one from uh, Paul R asks, who are your key or important competitors do they own similar IP and how do you actively protect your IP? So uh, I think what I'd like to do actually is split the competitive landscape into two parts. First of all, for Stereac cells and then secondly, for our Goliath cells, because actually the companies that are focusing on those different uh, addressable markets, those different sectors uh, are sometimes different organizations. So Stereax is a, a miniature solid state battery. And uh, actually the, the competitors for that type of technology uh, are relatively few and far between. Um, there are a couple of companies in the US uh, that we, uh, we interact with. One of them is FrontEdge uh, and one of them is Simbet. They're both privately held, uh, but they have developed similar thin film cells to ours. Um, we actually have differentiated IP. Uh, interestingly, they've chosen to use uh, a cell architecture and uh, chemistry that is more similar to the original Oak Ridge National Lab uh, IP that uses a, uh, a lithium anode, whereas we use a, um, a silicon structured anode. Um, so we are differentiated. We also use rather different processes. So um, part of what we do that's uh, novel is that we use uh, an evaporation technique for making our cathodes, and that allows us to avoid any post-deposition annealing, um, which means that actually we get high-quality cathode materials uh, without having to buy expensive sputtering targets um, so that, that we think gives us um, an advantage in the scalability of our process uh, and the cost point actually that that process can reach. In terms of actively protecting our IP, we have um, an in-house uh, lawyer 
who's uh, on secondment to us, um, and uh, she uh, works together with our team to harvest ideas um, that um, that come from uh, the team, both from Steriax and Goliath. Um, and then we, we prosecute our patents globally. So typically we make a national filing and then we uh, allow that to go through to the PCT stage, uh, from which point we then make other national filings around the globe. Uh, we also do a, what we call a freedom to operate search, which means we look to see what our competitors are filing uh, and then um, decide whether uh, we need to oppose uh, those uh, applications um, or, or indeed take other measures. So from the, the Goliath perspective, I'd say the competitive landscape was somewhat different. Um, the, you know, clearly these are the biggest markets uh, on the planet in terms of batteries. Uh, that um, the biggest incumbent battery manufacturers are also interested in addressing. And, you know, we, we saw that uh, forecast actually for solid state becoming dominant in the next 15 years for the EV market. So, so you know, if you were an incumbent battery manufacturer, you'd want to make sure that you had access to that technology too. So a lot of the, uh, the big players like Panasonic, uh, LG Chem, uh, Samsung, CATL in China and BYD have got uh, development programs in place uh, to look at uh, solid state, um, often using you know fairly varied approaches. You know, there's a, a quite a, an interesting landscape of, of different chemistries that people are, are looking at. But also outside of those incumbents, there are um, other technology developers like ourselves. Um, some of them in, in the U.S. and uh, and some in Asia. Um, I'd say in the U.S. you'd probably look at companies like QuantumScape and Solid Power, uh, and then in Asia Prologium, um, and uh, also there's a, another company called Solid Energy or uh, SES. You know these are all developers of EV scale uh, solid state batteries. Um, the, the IP is, is often different. Uh, one of our key uh, differentiators is the fact that our Goliath cells use an oxide electrolyte as opposed to a, uh, a sulfide electrolyte. Um, and, um, you know, there's, uh, I, I wouldn't say that any one of these technologies is likely to take a monopoly position. But um, there are pros and cons for using uh, the, the different approach. So I think that's that question. Let's have a look at another one here. Um, one from David M. He said he was looking at solid state batteries and came across uh, the Simbet um, batteries and um, saw that they're smaller than Steriax and uh, seem to have a higher energy density. So actually, um, it's um, the case is that our Steriax cells are designed to have a higher capacity um, so that means they're, they're capable of delivering a greater amount uh, of energy in total. And uh, our, our calculations actually show that uh, the Steriac cells that we use have got a, a higher energy density. Um, so we believe that they compare favorably uh, with that product line. Uh, Adrian C says, when might you expect your first order to be placed and then how long does it take to deliver the product? So, um, you know, we, we're actually currently um, already um, selling our Steriac cells to customers. Um, so we've sold to 16 different customers now and we have um, conditional orders for what we call our M300 product, which is our MVP or minimum viable product. So, so effectively the first product on our roadmap uh, as we sell to, uh, to more customers at larger scale. Um, and so that order book is building. Um, and as soon as our products are qualified and um, the, the cells are ready for um, you know, for commercial sales, then we will be uh, commencing larger volume shipments in uh, Q2 of next year. 
with respect to Goliath, Goliath is still uh, a, a prototype um, product that we are developing together with our customers. So often they uh, engage with us on uh, an NRE basis. By that I mean uh, we have a, a sort of collaboration with them uh, under which they receive um, you know, small quantities of prototype cells over the next year or so, uh, as the performance of these cells improves, uh, we will be making larger volumes of prototype cells available. Uh, and ultimately, you know, our scale-up plan is aligned to be able to match their product development roadmaps. Um, let's have a look. Next one from Adrian. Uh, how will the product be priced? Um, is it cost plus and how much scope do you have to increase prices if raw materials increase in price? Yeah, so, um, you know, our, our cells are, are largely um, priced in terms of the value that we think that we can uh, accrue through their sale into different applications. Um, you know, the different uh, markets have got a different tolerance for margins. I mean, typically, um, industrial markets are large volume, smaller uh, margin markets, uh, whereas some of the niches where we have some unique differentiators, like, for instance, in medtech, are a smaller volume for individual products, but are tolerant of higher margins. So, um, you know, we, we model the value of our technology within these applications and set a price point which is appropriate to that opportunity. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out here that the um, the pricing for Goliath and, and Stereax uh, are somewhat different. Um, for Goliath, a, a lot more of the, uh, the cost of the battery does reside in the raw material cost. Uh, and less associated with the with the processing cost than than the Stereax. So actually, the raw material costs for the for the miniature batteries are, are relatively low, um, but uh, there's obviously a lot more processing involved with those. Yeah, and so we need to keep an eye on what commodity prices do, uh, particularly for the uh, the Goliath cells, because probably about eighty five percent of the cost of manufacture of those cells comes from raw materials. So. Um, you know, lithium pricing uh, in particular is important. Um, so next, another question from Adrian. Thanks for your uh, interest here, Adrian. So who are the main competitors of Sterex? I think we've covered that actually. And uh, how will we compete on, on price or performance? So actually, um, it is largely on performance. We tend not to try and compete with anybody on price. Um, we believe that uh, actually the the performance of the cells um, with this type of new technology is what gains us uh, new customers. And we, we tend to try and address market segments that existing technology um, can't uh, support. So that's why, you know, the, the high temperature tolerance of our cells and also our ability to miniaturize them means that actually we can certainly differentiate ourselves relative to incumbent technology. You know, standard lithium-ion cells, coin cells, uh, they top out at about 60 degrees C, and you can't really make them much smaller than a couple of millimeters across. So the fact that we can go down to uh, very small sizes makes them ideal, in particular for some of these new medtech uh, applications where uh, you know, the, the inserted device that goes into the patient needs to be absolutely as small as possible. Um, let's have a look. So we've got a question from Kamal here. There seems to be a demand for hydrogen-based technology for the automotive industry. How does Goliath compare against the likes of series hydrogen tech that licenses to other manufacturers? Um, yeah, so... You know, I, actually, I'm a great believer in hydrogen being used uh, for transport applications. Um, you know, the, the main challenge, actually, with hydrogen is its distribution and storage. Um, I guess, you know, if we'd been having this conversation 
10 years ago, we probably would have still been debating whether fuel cell vehicles or battery powered vehicles were going to dominate. Well, I think that particular argument has been settled. Um, you know, battery powered vehicles uh, have, um, you know, certainly stolen a march on hydrogen technology. But the, the whole drive for electrification uh, will probably still involve hydrogen. And I think hydrogen has a role to play in range extenders. So I, I think that um, certainly in an urban environment, then electric vehicles powered by batteries uh, are at a, a decent price point. Uh, but if you're looking for long range vehicles, um, you know, some of the, the hybrid and by hybrid, I mean hydrogen and, and battery pack hybrids uh, are going to have a place, um, uh, you know, in, in particular in countries where larger traveling distances uh, are, uh, are part of society and, and part of the culture. Um, you know, Ceres Power, of course, is a solid oxide fuel cell business. Um, their technology runs on more than hydrogen. It can run on hydrogen, but it, it also runs on natural gas. Um, and I personally think that uh, solid oxide fuel cells will mainly be deployed in stationary applications um, where some of the, uh, the heat that's generated by that technology can be used usefully um, in, in the environment. Um, in, in the application. Um, uh, and I, I think actually probably in transport you'll see um, more PEM uh, fuel cell technology used uh, rather than solid oxide. Um, right, let's have another question here. Another one from Adrian. Must have been quick on the keyboard. Uh, to what extent are any lessons learned from Steriax applicable to Goliath and are you effectively starting from scratch? Well, I think there's actually one of the slides in the presentation uh, that we gave um, speaks to some of the, the learnings from Steriax. Um, you know, we've got a, a whole load of experience around um, the, the right choice of anodes. We actually used um, lithium metal anodes in the early uh, Steriax prototypes, and we were struggling a bit with delamination uh, of those composite structures, largely due to the stresses that are caused by the plating mechanism that you get in, uh, in Steriax cells, uh, where you use um, lithium anodes because um, you've got a mobile layer of lithium metal uh, against the current collector, which uh, actually causes a stress that's um, detrimental to long-term cycling. So we switched to a structured anode to um, to, uh, to silicon, which we found gave a, a stability to the cells that introduced a, a decent longevity. And, and that's why we're using uh, silicon in Goliath, which is rather, you know, different to, uh, to what's used, um, you know, by other uh, large format solid state developers. Um, so maybe just one final question. Um, let's have a, a flip through the list here. Um, so here you go. Here's an interesting one from Simon, actually, where he says, what do you think is the risk level of ILICA being beaten to the finishing line on EV battery solutions. So we, we often get this question is, um, you know, are you ahead of the competition and, you know, who do you think is the most advanced? It's actually quite difficult to be um, categoric about this because, you know, a lot of the technology developers um, only make cells available uh, for uh, testing and evaluation to their customers. You know, you would do the same. You wouldn't make them broadly available so your competitors would uh, would copy you. Um, and also, of course, in the big companies, they have no real need to uh, publish the, the progress that they're making. So, you know, if you're working on cells and you work in uh, CATL, you, you may not actually feel a need 
to to publish exactly where you are on solid state. I, I personally don't think that this market is going to um, tend towards a monopoly situation uh, where you know the the first company uh, that crosses the finishing line uh, ends up um, being a winner. Um, because uh, what we've seen from the lithium ion industry uh, historically is that uh, different chemistries uh, still proliferate even though we are sort of 30 years into the industry. You know, we see different types of cathode materials. Uh, we, we see different types of anode materials. Uh, you know, for instance, on the cathode side, we see uh, LCO is often used for consumer electronics batteries. Uh, we see that uh, NMC and NCA uh, are used in automotive, and, and some companies use um, uh, cobalt-free LFP uh, uh, in their batteries because it's it's lower cost. And I think we'll see the same with uh, solid state as a, a lot of these technologies will actually get through to commercialization. Uh, and I doubt that there'll be a, a single clear winner, but actually that you'll have uh, a number of different technologies uh, that are used, um, you know, broadly across different niches. Okay, thank you. Graham, Steve, thank you very much for being generous with your time and answering m many of the questions there. Obviously, for every question you you, you answered, another one came in. And um, But of, of course, the company will review any further questions submitted and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Graham, I just wondered before before um, redirecting investors for feedback, I wondered if I could ask you for a few closing comments. Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody for taking time out of their day to uh, to listen to our update. Uh, of course, there will be many more updates forthcoming uh, over the next year or so. And um, as I said at the outset, we hope to be able to organize a, an open day so that we can meet some of you face to face uh, and uh, answer some more of your questions at that juncture. Graham and Steve, thanks again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you will now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. And this will only take a few minutes to complete and is of great value to the company. On behalf of the management team, Bilika PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all.